welcome back and today we're getting back into some Centurion stuff. It's been a while since we were on this project but I'm really excited for what we're going to do today. Uh, about a month or so ago I went up to New Jersey to see VCF East and it was an absolute blast. But on the way home I swung by Pittsburgh to say hi to my brother and then I went over to Cincinnati to visit a school which is kind of a strange thing to visit on your way home but this particular school has a Centurion mini computer and it's actually a desk system a really rare system that I had never come across before and the school is Butler Tech it's a very cool kind of technical high school it makes me a little jealous my high school was sketchy at best and uh, this high school is extremely well equipped I uh, kind of wish I could just go hang out there more often they got amazing machine shops and stuff but Mr. Hall runs the IT section at that school and he's an absolute legend because he let me get hands-on with that desk system Centurion and unfortunately in the only day that we had there I couldn't quite get it going but I really wanted to see that CPU 5 come up and so he let me bring the CPU 5, the 32K memory, the two disc controller cards and the MUX card in the back plane all home with me so we can hopefully get them up and running here and the first step of all of that is to start backing up important things most notably the CPU 5 here they had a very basic instruction set that came from the EE200 and that was eventually evolved into the CPU 4 and then they created the CPU 5 which was an AM2901 based version of the CPU 4 with some DMA operations thrown in and then they created the CPU 6 which had an instruction set that was nearly twice as big so looking at the CPU 5 is kind of like looking back in time as to what the Centurion CPU system was like before all of the new instructions on the CPU 6 and we can get a really close look at that by pulling all of the code off of the microcode ROMs right here so all we got to do is pull these ROMs out pop them in my little Arduino based ROM reader here and back the contents up and then we can get a really good idea of where the CPU 5 differs from the CPU 6 and then we'll also have a safe backup of them which makes me a whole lot less scared to put power into this thing and then we can power it up and maybe see what it's got and what it can do but well the CPU 5 and the CPU 6 have very different instruction sets and all of the CPU 6 software will not run on a CPU 5 because it's using that newer instruction set so we need some CPU 5 era software and it just so happens that Mr. Hall being an absolute legend again let me bring home this disk pack out of the Hawk drive that they had in their desk system I have no idea what's on it I do know that on the back here it says systems disk so there could potentially be a CPU 5 operating system on here that would be best best case scenario uh, there could also be some CPU 5 era programs or it could just be accounting data who knows what's actually on here and the only way to actually find out is to plug it into this Hawk drive spin it up and pull the data off of it and that's what I want to do today but it's always a little sketchy putting an unknown pack into a good drive so we're going to try and take every precaution we can to ensure that the heads don't crash so we got a lot of work to do we got to back up the CPU 5 we got to pull the data off of this and then we got to sift through all this wonderful new information that we got and figure out what we're working with so let's get to work all right let's get started on dumping those ROMs we'll pop each ROM out with my little hook tool here and the one that we want to dump we'll just plug into my little homemade ROM reader and I get a lot of questions about this reader but it's really just super dead simple it's just an Arduino Nano Every with the address and data pins of the ROM hooked directly up to the IO pins of the Arduino then it's just a little bit of coding to make the Arduino set the appropriate pins for the address read the data pins convert the binary red value to hex print it to the serial monitor increment the address and then do it all over again I'll put a link to the code below though I'm not a good programmer so it's not pretty code at all but as you can see pretty or not that code works and we're getting good hex values out 
Next, let's inspect the platter to make sure it's clean. And we can open it up by removing the little screws around the periphery. Then we just lift the plastic off and yeah, that, that is a clean looking platter. Certainly no crashes, but also no scratches or anything else that should cause a problem. Even still, I'm going to purge it for a while. So I need to get to the head plug on the Hawk, which means I need to remove the back cover. And then I just need to unplug this little plug right here. Then we'll pull the whole drive out unlock the clamps and remove the pack that normally lives in there. And then I'll drop in the new pack, put the dust cover in place and push the clamps back over. Then just hit the start stop button and the purging process begins. I've got it spin purging. This is just to try and get any remote speck of dust out of there so that the heads fly perfectly when we load them. And I'm gonna let it do this for about 30 minutes, but Here's the game plan. Once it's done spin purging, we'll hook the heads back up and we will spin it up and load into the operating system using the fixed platter. Then we can see if it can actually read the removable platter from within the OS. If it does actually read it and we can see some of the files on there, anything that looks like it's extremely important We'll do a very quick copy from the removable platter to the fixed platter to save those particular files. Then after that, we'll spin it all down, put the Diag card and boot into CCDP, and then get a full image of the removable platter. That takes about 45 minutes. If the head alignment is bad, we gotta do some extra work. So let's hope that the heads are actually aligned. All right, heads are plugged in, computer is on. Let's push the start stop button and cross our fingers. Heads loaded. It doesn't sound like there was a crash. Let's see if we can get into the OS. We're loading, that's good. All right, we got into the OS, we'll do a status. Man, it's not reading the name of platter zero. Let's do a .dir zero, see what happens. Abort, incorrect disk code. So I bet you that's a head alignment problem. I was really hoping that wouldn't be the case, but well, that's how it goes. We got a lot, of, a lot more work to do. Okay, before we get too deep into any head alignment shenanigans, I wanted to just do a little quick read to see if CCDP could read the Hawk drive. And that'll tell us if it's aligned, if it's not aligned, if it is aligned, maybe it's just a formatting issue or something like that. So I booted into CCDP here and it's still cool every time I see it. Uh, so we're going to run the program Hawk REA, and that's going to let us test it out. I kicked the lights off, so hopefully it's a little easier to see. So we'll just do HWK REA. It's going to ask me the unit number, and we want to do removable platter, so it's going to be zero. Uh, and we want to test, let's just start with cylinder zero. That's going to be the Whipple. And we don't want to RTZ on an error, and we're ready to begin. That's reading correctly. That's reading the Whipple like it's supposed to. Uh, so we'll hit space. Let's run it again and pick a different cylinder in the middle. Uh, again, zero. Do test uh, 0080. That's kind of uh, nice in the middle there. We don't want to RTZ on error. Let's begin. Seeking out to 0080. That's all clean reads. Um, so maybe it's just a formatting error. That's really fascinating. But it uh, doesn't matter. We want to dump this platter to the hard drive. So let's, let's do that right quick. Uh, we're going to do HWK DMP. Uh, we want the output file name to be uh, CPU5PLT for CPU5 platter. Uh, we want the unit to be zero. We want the starting cylinder to be zero. And yeah, we're ready to begin. There we go. 
we are dumping data off of the CPU5 platter that we got from Butler Tech up in Cincinnati. We're up to cylinder one, so we're, <laughs> we're into some new stuff. Oh, this is exciting. Status report, we are up to nearly cylinder 0080 where we did our uh, test earlier and we are getting the occasional bad sector. They all seem to be on the lower side of the platter. The upper side seems to be going just fine. Uh, but we're getting enough solid data that we should be able to at least dig through and see what's going on on this platter. And if the operating system knows about these bad sectors, it just creates a bad sector table and writes data around them. So there may actually be nothing in those anyways. Uh, but it still looks like we're getting huge amounts of good data. This is fantastic news. There we go. The platter has been successfully dumped completely. Oh, it's so exciting. I'm really curious what's on this platter. Now we did get a lot of bad sector reads right at the end here, and they're all on the lower head, but from about uh, the cylinder 0070 to 0170, it was flawless. We had perfect reads the entire time. So we got a very large majority of beautiful, perfect reads. Also the bad sectors right here at the end shouldn't have any data in them anyways because Centurion didn't really do anything smart about spreading loadout across the platter. They're just all uh, stacked up sequentially. So unless the platter is 100% full, these here at the end would have just been blank data anyways. So the next step is to try and figure out what on earth is on this platter. And we've got some tools that we're gonna lean on to get that done and Oh man, I can't wait. There might possibly be an operating system on here, or it could just be a whole lot of really boring data, but either way, it's gonna be interesting to look at. All right, I've shot the platter off to Ren. Uh, hopefully he's gonna run his tools on it, but before I spin the Hawk Drive down, I, I gotta try it. I'm gonna turn the RF uh, switch off. I'll hit select, and let's try to boot from the removable platter. We couldn't read it from within the CPU6 OS, but maybe there's an OS hiding out on that platter. So we'll type uh, H0, uh, HDIPL 5.8. That's a different version of the Whipple. I think that's an older version of the Whipple. So we've got a name equals prompt. We'll type et OSN, uh, and that's on disk zero. There is, well, it didn't ask me for the code. That's interesting. Whoa! <laughs> DOS 5.6-D, Centurion 3, oh, there's so much stuff going on, I don't understand. Max disk equal one, system disk equal one. I think we want system disk to equal zero because that's the removable platter. So let's go S uh, equals zero here. And then we'll just hit enter. Previous system date is August 24th, 1989. Just one day different from the date that I usually use. Uh, so 08-24-89, uh, leave the system time blank. This is all looking very much so. Oh my gosh, exec ready. We're in the operating system. We're in a totally different operating system that I've never seen. Let's see if the commands still work. We'll do a .sta. Oh my gosh. I have no idea what any of that means, but JCL 2.32, it doesn't list the disks. It just lists the memory that is allotted for uh, the CRT. Oh, it does list disks here. So zero is system one. It doesn't understand the CPU six disk. So let's do a dot DIR space zero. Oh my God, it's full. It's full of data, good data at that. <laughs> There's so much. There's so much data on here. It's all good, it's all readable. Some of it I recognize, a lot of it I don't. Looks like they have the general ledger on here. It's got GL menu on it. That's something I've been meaning to get to because we have that for CPU six as well. But we have something else too. We've got PR menu and DP menu. Those are uh, completely different applications maybe. So we may have even more newer applications that we can then dig through. 
there's so much nothing is in libraries, it seems. It's just all in the root directory. It's never ending. But there is so much good stuff on here. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. <laughs> I don't know what to do next. Uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna have to stop the camera and think about the next plan, where to go from here, because I did not expect to see this much stuff in there. That is, oh, that's awesome. All right, we know we have a good copy of the CPU-5 operating system on the removable platter, and we were able to boot into that with the CPU-6 and a 128K memory card, which is interesting. I didn't realize they would be backwards compatible like that. But what I really wanna see is if the hardware from the desk system is good, and that's what this is. We have the CPU-5, Disk 1, Disk 2, MUX, and a 32K memory card. Uh, now the Disk 1, Disk 2, and MUX cards are all identical to the ones that I have. The two really unique cards that I don't have are the CPU 5 and the 32K memory. So hopefully both of those work perfectly, and then we can uh, diagnose and see how these are going. But I think the best way to test all of this is to take all five of these, pop it into the good backplane of the genuine system, and just send it. Everything's been going really well today, so uh, I'm gonna keep riding that wave, and I think this is all gonna work perfectly. So let's get it all plugged in and throw some electrons at it. All right, everything is plugged in. Now the CRT won't turn on until I turn the main power on because I've got it plugged into switched power on the back. So we won't know immediately if it booted all the way to a D equals prompt, but we'll know if there's some fatal error if we're still running or halted based on the uh, blinking lights up here. So all we gotta do is switch this power, look at the blinking lights, and then hopefully once the CRT warms up, we see D equals. Uh, <laughs> genuinely the first time I've ever put power into these cards. Let's see how it goes. So the blinking lights came on into halt. That's not uncommon, that happens on the occasion. Let's just hit the reset button. It's still running. That's good news. <laughs> so we have a D equals prompt. That means all of the hardware is functioning. We have the MUX card outputting to the terminal. We have uh, the memory card working correctly and the CPU is fully booting. <laughs> Yes! Now we just gotta see if disk 1 and disk 2 work, and we can do that by turning the Hawk Drive on right here and trying to boot into the CPU 5 operating system. Okay, Hawk is spun up, heads are loaded. Let's try to boot into the CPU 5 Opsys using the CPU 5. We'll type H0, did three RTZs, DOS 5.6-D, Centurion 3, uh, we do need to change the system disk, S equals zero. Uh, and then we'll just go ahead and hit enter. Then we'll set the same previous date, 8.24.89. We'll just hit enter on system time. Then we got exec ready. <laughs> We're fully booted into the CPU5 operating system using genuine CPU5 hardware. We'll do a dot STA and there we go. <laughs> yes! That is awesome. Mr. Hall, all of your hardware is working. And let's put some of that hardware to the test. If we do a dot dir space zero, this gives us a directory listing of everything that's in uh, the CPU5 platter. There's a lot of things going on in here that are just kind of hard to figure out because the concept of libraries doesn't really work very well on this operating system. But there is one file that is quite interesting. It's this one right here. King. So we're going to get to the end of the directory listing here, and then we're just going to type King. <laughs> this is a simple game of life or death. Your job, should you choose to accept the assignment, is to manage the affairs of your kingdom for 10 years so that people will prosper, avoiding the perils of bad crops, plague, and the rats, which will keep nibbling at your success. This is a full-fledged video game on the Centurion. We found some games. There's a ton of really interesting files on this platter, and Mr. Hall, all of your hardware is working perfectly. With the exception of the backplane, we still had a problem with the backplane previously and that the bootstrap ROM had some pins rusted off. So the next goal is to try and get that backplane fixed. 
All right, let's get the back plane and card cage out, and then we'll just remove the bootstrap ROM with my little hook tool, alternating side to side to keep from bending the pins. And here's the problem. Two pins have rusted completely off, but a little bit of cleaning and solder later, and there we go, two brand new pins attached. The bigger problem though is that one of the pins is still stuck in the socket. I tried to remove it, but it ain't budging. So I think we're gonna have to replace the whole socket, which means I need to remove the back plane from the card cage. And it's just held in with some Phillips head screws. And with all of those screws removed, the back plane just falls right out. To desolder the socket, first we'll add clean solder to all of the pins. Then I'll get my desoldering iron out and go through one by one, removing all of the solder. After that, it just pries right out with ease, and you'll have to take my word for it because I totally blocked the camera with my hand. Uh, next, we'll clean up the PCB with some alcohol and a Q-tip, and that's cleaning up quite nicely. Uh, then we'll solder in the new socket, making sure it sits nice and flat. And finally, we'll pop the bootstrap ROM back into place, all ready for testing. All right, it's time to give the back plane with our botched together bootstrap ROM a test. In order to do that, I need a lot of voltages, plus 12, minus 12, plus five, and I need a uh, 60 hertz time of day clock signal coming in. Best way to get that is with a Centurion power supply. This is a ferro resonant power supply that came out of a Centurion, so it is the perfect power supply to test it with. Now plugged into this, I have the CPU 5, the MUX card, and the memory card. I don't have any disk control cards in here because we already know that those work. All we really want to see is if the backplane works. And in order to test that, I've got a little terminal set up here. This is my uh, VT320 that I've been using on the PDP-1183. Centurion doesn't support VT100 or VT320 or any of the deck terminals, but well, serial data is serial data, so at the very least, we should be able to see a D equals prompt on here if everything goes smoothly. So we'll flip the breaker on the back here, and we're hoping to see a D equals prompt up here, and we don't. <laughs> oh, that's good news. We got an error. Uh, when I hit reset, we're getting an error out of it, which might mean that it is a uh, data communication error or a parity thing. Uh, I have it set up to the correct parity, but I forgot what error here means. Or that could just be the bootstrap ROM is not operating correctly. I don't know, but that's uh, better than nothing. All right, slight change of plan. Uh, I was talking with Ken Romaine and apparently I didn't quite fully understand how the uh, bootstrap ROM on the CPU-5 systems work. On the CPU-6 system, it gets you to a D equals prompt. And from there you can type uh, H, F, or C to boot from the Hawk drive, the Finch or Floppy, or uh, CMD drives, which would be like the Phoenix or a Lark or something like that but the CPU-5 ROM just immediately boots into whatever is hard-coded into it. This is a Hawk ROM, so it's just going to immediately try to boot into a Hawk drive. You could swap the entire ROM out for a floppy ROM, so then it would try to boot immediately into a floppy system. But what that means is that if there is not a disk one, disk two, or a running Hawk drive in there, the ROM just displays error. That's what it was supposed to do. That's the error that we were seeing before. So I have both the drive control cards into it. The Hawk drive is on and spun up and I'm borrowing the ads regent CRT that's up here. So that way we can see if it boots properly. So let's turn the power on here. And we got some stars up there, so I think that means it's running. Let's hit the select button on this one, and it did three RTZs. Look at that, we got to the, the Whipple, the HDIPL there. Uh, so if we do name equals at OSN, uh, hit enter, tell it disk zero, hit enter again, that should start booting it into the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it booted into the operating system. There we go. <laughs> we're fully back into the operating system. So this CPU-5 bootstrap ROM is working 
perfectly even with the two pins soldered on. So I'm gonna pull it off and dump the contents of it like immediately so we have a backup of the CPU5 ROM. But all of the CPU5 hardware from Cincinnati is now confirmed working. That is epic. This is almost ready to go back up to Cincinnati and get plugged into the desk system up there. There's a few other small things that I need to do. Chief among which is find uh, some new switches for the front panel here because these are all very much so beat up and broken. And we still have a little more reverse engineering work to do on the CPU 5 and the 32K memory. This is stuff that is very time consuming and not really all that exciting to show on video. But I think it's really important that we get schematics of these cards while we can. So Mr. Hall, if you're watching, your hardware is 100% working and we are almost ready to bring it back up to Cincinnati. Once we get those schematics made, I'll get in touch with you and we'll figure out how to get this back into the desk system and get that one spun up. This has been an absolutely epic episode. We found so much amazing stuff. We found a full second operating system and it's all thanks to Mr. Hall at Butler Tech. So thank you so much, Mr. Hall. Thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next episode.